Okay, well, uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, let me say uh, thank you to Karen uh, Levasseur for her fine, careful, um, expert editing of the second volume, the first and second volume, and thank you again, Karen, for the opportunity and for having the vision to develop a, you know, I think a very uh, scholastically rigorous uh, volume, but very accessible and very readable, I think, for, for all Manitobans. So, um, a really important contribution to our policy debates in, in this province. Um, and thank you to the uh, audience members for being here this evening. This is great. Um, Public policies that matter for Manitobans. Wow, infrastructure. Don't we all have something to say about infrastructure? Uh, navigating the cracked uh, sidewalks, uh, the potholes. Um, you know, it's the, these stories are legion in Winnipeg, are they not? In Manitoba, certainly. Um, in the article that I contributed to the uh, to the Law Journal, I argue that, um, and and I'm not the only one that's argued this, but I'm taking a Manitoba perspective here. I argue that uh, a from the ground up approach is required to address what I see are some significant, if not crippling, uh, policy gaps and capacity gaps in the infrastructure sector in Manitoba. Now all jurisdictions, all policy jurisdictions have unique conceptual factors that influence development, policy definition, construction, uh, spending decisions. Um, I argue uh, that Manitoba is exceptional with regards to infrastructure renewal because we are a province of just over one million people with only one urban center, really significant urban center, in, in the far south of the province. Uh, we have over just one million people sprinkled across a very vast, very uh, varied geographical expanse where people live in quite uh, unique and different environmental conditions and landscapes, uh, surrounded by a, a tremendous amount of uh, waterways, and of course, this really differentially impacts um, infrastructure realities for them and infrastructure renewal. Um, not the least of which to say that it, sort of, it differentially impacts uh, the cost of projects, certainly very different from Churchill to, uh, to Winnipeg, and um, the potential for those projects to be successful and being proposals that the federal governments at the multiple levels of governments will accept and can be funded in a sort of a, a cost-sharing uh, way between community groups, municipalities, most often small ones, rural and remote, not just Winnipeg here, of course, and the federal government. So it's, uh, I think, very unique in the, in the sense of um, its uh, influence and uh, factors around the quality of life, because that's what infrastructure ultimately is about, infrastructure renewal. We think it's about, of course, it is about movement of people, obviously, right? It is about the economy and trade. We, we need that. Um, but it is about our quality of life because infrastructure is so, so much more than just our traditional understanding of its, you know, roads, pipes, and bridges. We also have one of the most sprawling urban centers in Canada, um, in Winnipeg, that is. And certainly, again, this speaks to the challenges of addressing infrastructure capacity gaps in the province. We're a province that experiences wild swings in weather. We all know this. We experience this every year, do we not? Um, and these weather part patterns, of course, often have you know catastrophic um, effects on devastating crumb and crumbling and wreak havoc and destroy our our surrounding um, infrastructure, pipes, concrete, land surfaces, and again, we're all very familiar with this. Um, just echoing uh, what Karen has said in her opening comments, and again, we're in provinces which is perpetually have not province. We continually, historically, perpetually have economic instabilities. Uh, difficulties around um, uh, financial capacities to effectively, you know, target spending and certainly address the many infrastructure needs um, within uh, within the province, which again is not just about roads, bridges, and pipes, but it's about recycling plants, community centers, cultural centers, libraries, uh, internet and broadband access. I mean, th and these are just a few parks. Um, the tangible and intangibles, and, and and scholars in the infrastructure field are now including. Again, uh, the intangible infrastructures, human resources, skilled labor, that's, a, that's part of the infrastructure. Uh, data collection um, uh, services, uh, weather predicting services, these are also important infrastructures and in, in certainly in the contemporary um, 21st century. And we know that again, these catastrophic uh, events really leave again, they add to the financial burden of the province. What is it, the 2011 billion, 2011 flood cost about to what, one billion, I think Karen, you reported this in your, in your piece. And so this leaves Manitoba dependent on federal transfers. Um, and indeed, in 2012, according to my uh, research, 30% uh, of the provincial revenues were from federal transfers. So that's significant. 
So it's very complex, complicated, interesting, for, my, for, for a scholar's perspective, uh, policy area. Um, it's very complex. It often, it, infrastructure renewal often requires uh, collaboration and horizontality within governments, right, between departments. That poses a challenge. Um, it often requires um, an understanding, which of course is not always appreciated by the public, but infrastructure works are in themselves very complex. It's difficult to know the value of infrastructure works because they're often not seen by us, underground pipes, etc. One part of the infrastructure may be refurbished um, and over a long period of time, and that, that lends to some ambiguity as to how much that infrastructure actually is valued or worth. So it makes it difficult for governments to make decisions around, okay, well, I'm going to allocate, you know, 50 million or 15 billion to this area in infrastructure expansion. Um, so it's, you know, it's very difficult to understand uh, the uh, refurbishment uh, leads to unknown lifetime of, of, uh, of infrastructure. It's a very complex area. More money is needed, of course, but often what this takes, of course, is governments making tough decisions, and if they're stuck, right, and they make a decision in a perhaps in a process that isn't amenable to public uh, um, favor, um, they have to increase taxes to pay for this. And those are often, of course, not very popular decisions. Um, it requires coordination between the levels of government. It's a classic multi-level governance issue. Um, and certainly in a federal system like Canada, we have uh, governments, provincial, municipal, and federal, that, and I don't include municipal here, but mostly provincial and federal, often engage in this sort of uh, blame avoidance. You know, don't look to us, it's not our problem. Uh, we don't have the funds for it, we'll go to the feds. Feds say, don't look at us, it's a provincial problem. So it's a, it's in a continuous blame avoidance, and really what's uh, in the federalism literature is called a joint decision trap. You really get trapped, and then what comes out of that policy decision making is the least common denominator. It's the least you can do. So we end up with a patchwork of different uh, multiple, a dizzying array, I think I put it in, the, in my article, of, of infrastructure funding programs. Um, and of course, um, having said all this, this leaves Manitoba, as I said, quite dependent on national political whims, and, there, and therefore often quite subservient to um, you know, uh, decision making at the federal level. Well, what's the way forward? The way forward, I argue in my piece, is certainly shoring up intergovernmental relations, um, including uh, municipalities as a partner and not as a, as a creature of the province necessarily, but certainly uh, bolstering intergovernmental relations, particularly in Winnipeg, um, so that municipalities have more direct say in discussions, in bringing to the table their experiences, their difficulties around resource generation and uh, revenue generation, and make them an equal partner within this process of renewal around infrastructure. And I also argue, of course, that municipalities have more own source revenue. Ultimately, I argue for a national infrastructure strategy. Um, this, of course, is unlikely to happen. Um, I think that um, we have a Conservative Party government, and you know they're not a, 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 the only governments at fault. Certainly, this has been going on for, with Liberal governments as well. But we have a current government that's been in power for quite a few years, um, who, on the one hand, defends decentralized federalism, but the provinces you know, use their talents on their own to address their interests. Sounds good, sounds what you want to do, but they also like to defend themselves as being the national voice, right? And being sort of in the driver's seat. So there's mixed messages there. And it is clearly, I think again, Kara's put it quite right, uh, we see the, con the current um, Conservative Party, the federal government, um, using infrastructure, and most notably since the, the most recent budget announcements, and with this Canada 150 program that they recently announced, um, Mr. Harper made an announcement a few days ago, um, it's, it's, a, it's a political tool, it's a political strat strategy and political capital. It's decision making, um, keeping in um, through the lens of marketing, where can they, where can they seek out votes best, right? So um, a, a national strategy is not, uh, not, not uh, likely to come in the, in, the, in the medium term or even the, perhaps in the long term. But nonetheless, it's a policy sector that I think all of us are uh, keenly aware of. Citizens are, are left with a you know, patchwork of, of, of programs which are made by political decisions, which are for capital reasons around vote, increasing their vote base. And at, at the end of the day, a crippled policy system. I'm not, I'm not prepared to say it's a policy failure because there, there is an important spend, there is important infrastructure renewal, and the province is, I think, doing their best given their, you know, their financial difficulties. But nonetheless, the community's built environment is, 
is key and one that certainly is a state of disrepair and requires, I think, more uh, concerted effort on all parties. Thanks very much.